Hi everyone and welcome to this video about psychiatric injury within the law of tort. Uh, first things first, it's currently a snow day. I'm at home, not at college, so I haven't got my proper microphone. So I apologise if I'm a little bit muffled. Um, you're just going to have to keep your ears pinned back so you can hear. Um, also, this is going to be quite a sizable video because I'm putting everything to do with psychiatric injury in here. Not only the law, but also the evaluation and the um, scenario question answering. I would suggest that you have a look at this in a couple of goes, um, but it's all going to be in one place for you so that it's easy to look back on. So we're looking at the different types of victims around psychiatric injury. So what is psychiatric injury for a start? Well, Hines and Berry from 1970 says, in English law, no damages are awarded for grief or sorrow caused by a person's death. No damages are given for worry about their children or for the financial strain or stress or the difficulties of adjusting to a new life. Damages, however, are recoverable for nervous shock or to put it in medical terms for any recognised psychiatric illness caused by the breach by the defendant. So why the sudden shock requirement? Well, the courts have decided that if psychiatric injury is the result of gradual appreciation of events rather than a sudden shock, there'll be no liability. And this is probably because of the fear of opening the floodgates to numerous claims. So you've got to perceive the shock and suffer the injury straight away. You can't gradually come to it because it would open the floodgates to people who suffer psychiatric injury days, weeks, months, even possibly years in the future and that would lead to uncertainty for everyone involved which is not good and it would also lead to absolutely loads of claims coming through. So we limit the number of claims by ensuring that the shock has got to be sudden. So there are three categories of victim which we're going to go through. Primary victims, secondary victims and rescuers. So let's focus our attention first of all on primary victims. So these are victims who suffer psychiatric injury as a direct result of the defendant's negligence, in addition usually to physical damage or because of fear of personal physical injury or damage. So let's have a look at a couple of cases which illustrate this. First of all we've got Paige and Smith. The defendant negligently hit the, vi the victim with his car and the victim's existing condition, which is ME, or chronic fatigue syndrome, which was getting better at the time, worsened permanently as a result of the accident, preventing him from ever returning to work. And the rule of law was, if it is reasonably foreseeable that the claimant will suffer some personal injury, the defendant will be liable for the claimant's nervous shock as well. In a similar vein, we also have a tear and British gas. Our claimant was very house proud and she left British Gas installing a new boiler in her property. When she returned home she found that the house was on fire and permanent damage had resulted. And the rule of law was, the claimant may successfully sue for psychiatric injury resulting from the defendant negligently damaging her property. So primary victims are quite straightforward. Psychiatric injury is seen as another type of damage so whether it's physical damage whether it's property damage whether it's psychiatric injury as long as it's sudden then the courts will allow somebody to claim secondary victims are a far more complex issue so these are victims who suffer psychiatric injury as a result of fearing for another safety because of our defendant's negligence and the leading case here is the Alcock case Alcock and Chief Constable of South Yorkshire Police. So this case contained 10 plaintiffs, they were at the time described as plaintiffs, they're now called claimants, who brought claims against the South Yorkshire Police. All 10 claimed damages for nervous shock resulting in psychiatric illness, which they allege was caused by their experiences inflicted on them by the Hillsborough disaster. So you've got 10 individuals with varying different relationships with the people who actually died in the Hillsborough disaster. And they all suffered psychiatric injury. 
and the question was were they allowed to claim. If you're unfamiliar with the Hillsborough disaster, I would pause this video here and I would Google it. Uh, have a look on YouTube, there are some really detailed YouTube videos which outline exactly what happened. It's one of those things that as a future lawyer you just need to know about. So in this case it was held that to be a secondary victim a claimant must witness the event with his or her unaided senses or hear the events in person or view its immediate aftermath. In other words the claimant must be in close physical proximity to the event. This means that people who witness the event on television, hear it on the radio or informed about the event from a third party are unlikely to be classified as secondary victims. So what I'd like you to do, pause the video here and I'd like you to tell me how many of the 10 claimants in the Orcott case were actually in the stadium at the time of the Hillsborough disaster. So of the 10 claimants, only two of them were in the stadium at the time, Robert Alcock and Brian Harrison. And the court said this, it was held that the claimant must usually show for sufficient proximate relationship with the victim. This is often described as close ties of love and affection. So we assume that this is the case between from parents to children, spouses and fiancés. And it means that other relations, including siblings, brothers and sisters, must prove their ties of love and affection. This is what the judges said in the Orcott case. So there are the three judges we've got here. First of all, Lord Keith says, Brian Harrison lost two brothers. Robert Alcock lost a brother-in-law and identified the body in the mortuary at midnight. In neither of these cases was there any evidence of particularly close ties of love or affection with the brothers or brother-in-law. Lord Acne says, the quality of brotherly love is well known to differ widely. And Lord Jauncey says, only two plaintiffs, Mr and Mrs Coppock, lost a son, that they saw the disaster on television. None of the other plaintiffs who lost relatives sought to establish that they had relationship of love and affection with the victim comparable to that of spouse or parent. So overall in this case, and these are the rules of law that you'll need to record, it was held that it must be proved that it was reasonably foreseeable that the claimant would suffer psychiatric damage. The closer the tie between the plaintiff, claimant and the victim, the more likely it is that he would succeed in showing that the psychiatric damage was reasonably foreseeable. That means the reasonable foreseeability depends on establishing a sufficiently proximate relationship. The House of Lords did hint that a person with no sufficiently proximate relationship may be classed as a secondary victim in except exceptional circumstances. But Lord Keith said, the case of a bystander unconnected to the victim of an accident is difficult. Psychiatric injury to him would not ordinarily, in my view, be within the range of reasonable foreseeability, but could not perhaps be entirely excluded from it if the circumstances of a catastrophe occurring very close to him were particularly horrific. Now, if you did as I suggested, paused the video and went and looked at what the Hillsborough disaster was. It was a crush in a football stadium where 96 people lost their lives. As a result of police mismanagement, a huge amount of people were surging into a very small area very, very quickly and the people at the front of that crush were crushed to death. And this was broadcast on live television and people in the stadium witnessed as people died. One has to wonder quite what Lord Keith was recurring to when he said that there could be a catastrophe occurring very close to him that were particularly horrific. What more horrific thing could you witness than seeing 96 people crushed to death? 
but maybe that's my view. So moving along, we have McLaughlin and O'Brien. In this case, we have a wife who finds out that her family have been involved in a horrific car accident. One child is killed instantly, and the mother is taken to the hospital and sees the extent of her surviving family's injuries. She sees them before they've been treated and before they've been cleaned up. And she su suffers depression as a result. And the rule of law is this. The House of Lords extended the class of persons who would be considered proximate to the event to those who come within the immediate aftermath of the event. So she is included because she sees the results, she sees the aftermath almost straight away afterwards in its rawest form. So she sees her family with the severity of their injuries not hidden in any way by any medical intervention. So moving along to Borhill and Young, this is a very old case. And in this case, the victim heard an accident and saw the blood on the ground sometime later on. She just stepped off the tram and the accident occurred on the other side of the tram. So although she was very, very close to it, she didn't see what happened. And when she came back, she saw the blood on the road, but she didn't see any bodies or anything like that. But the shock of everything that she saw caused her to suffer a miscarriage. And the rule of law was this. There was no foreseeability, no foreseeable harm or relationship between the motorcyclist who caused the accident and Borhill. Nor was there a close relationship and therefore she had no claim. And so we see originally in Borhill and Young and then later on in Alcock the courts are very reluctant to allow anybody to be a secondary victim unless you see the rawest moments and you are directly linked to these individuals by the closest of ties of love and affection. So let's move on and have a look at rescuers. So these are a special category of secondary victim. These are people who suffer nervous shock as a result of being involved in the rescue of victims of the defendant's negligence. And there are two competing policy considerations here. On the one hand, the law needs to restrict wide liability, so an economic policy is in play, so we don't allow everybody to make a claim. But we can't discourage people from carrying out rescues and demonstrating their bravery in helping people. So a social policy is directly in competition with economic policy here. And we have to very carefully balance the two. And this is the way that the courts have done it in case law. So until the 1990s, a rescuer who suffered psychiatric injury due to being involved in a rescue operation was able to claim. However, this has been restricted in recent years. In McFarlane, the claimant had a prior history of depression and he witnessed a massive explosion on an oil rig. He was 100 metres away at the time in one of the support vessels and his colleagues had been involved in pulling victims from the sea, although he personally didn't do this. And he lodged his claim either as a primary victim or as a rescuer. And the court said that he's not a primary victim because he was not actually in physical danger. He was far enough away at the time not to be at risk. And he was not a rescuer because he didn't actually rescue anybody. He just witnessed other people who did. And we also see similar logic in the case of White and Chief Constable of South Yorkshire. So these are the police officers, four police officers, tried to claim damages due to their involvement in the Hillsborough disaster. They'd been in the gym with the bodies, but hadn't been near the Leppings Lane stand where the tragedy actually took place. And the rule of law is this. With regards to rescuers, their status as rescuers does not automatically place them as a primary victim. To amount to a primary victim, even a rescuer must demonstrate that they were in the zone of physical danger. Since the claimant themselves were not at risk of physical injury, their claims could not succeed. They also didn't carry out the rescuing element, so they were unsuccessful. 
So what I'd like you to do is, if you want to pause the video here and create for yourself a table that looks something like this. And what I'd like you to do is go back through the video and fill in the definitions of primary, secondary and rescuers. The rules of law establish uh, the rules of law for establishing a duty of care, and make a note of the key cases. And this can be your revision tool that you can use for having a look at a scenario question. So hopefully, your diagram looks something like this. So a primary victim suffers nervous shock as a direct result of the defence negligence. Often, the nervous shock is an additional injury and there's no policy reasons for restricting liability. So the rule of law, if it is reasonably foreseeable that the claimant will suffer some personal injury, the defendant will be liable for the claimant's nervous shock too. On secondary victims, the definition, claimant suffers nervous shock as a result of fearing for another. Policy considerations require that such wide liability be restricted. And the rule of law for establishing the claimant must be at the scene of the accident or come across the immediate aftermath and have close ties of love and affection with the victim. And rescuers suffer nervous shock as a result of being involved in a rescue operation due to the defendant's negligence. Policy requires that claimants are treated leniently by law. And the rule of law, if the defendant negligently causes another to be rescued and the claimant is sufficiently involved with the rescue, the defendant will be liable for the claimant's nervous shock. So make sure that you've compared your table with the tables that have just gone through and added in any detail that you need. So, we're nearly there people. We're not far off now. So I'm going to read to you a long and complicated scenario question. This is not the sort of thing that you're going to get in an exam but it's been designed so that it covers everything, so that we can see how everything fits together. So it is a bit long, it is a bit complicated. All I want you to do at the moment is grab a pen and a piece of paper and make a note of the possible claimants. You'll need to note down their name. And also, are they primary, secondary or rescuers? Okay, so let's see how we get on. So this is your scenario. Ranjeev was a fully trained crane operator employed by AB Cranes. AB Cranes inspected and maintained their cranes each day in order to comply with safety requirements. One day, Ranjeev, whilst operating his crane in the usual manner, dropped a heavy load of concrete from a height of 15 metres when the cable gave way. The load hit Sanjay, a co-worker, on the ground below, trapping his legs. Sanjay's legs were crushed by the weight of the concrete and he screamed in agony. Other workers of AB Cranes ran to help Sanjay, attempting to relieve the pressure of the load on his legs, but were unable to do anything significant to help him. As a result, Ricardo, one of the workers who had tried to help, suffered lasting psychiatric injury. The fire brigade arrived and released Sanjay, who was taken to hospital. One of the firefighters, Roy, was so distressed by the incident and the sight of Sanjay that he suffered post-traumatic stress disorder, reliving the incident time and time again in his mind. As a result, he was unable to resume his job as a firefighter. Simon, an AB Crane's employee, was sent to tell Sanjay's wife, Sonal, at home three miles away of the incident. She was so upset by Simon's graphic account of the accident that she too suffered severe and persisting nervous shock and was later diagnosed with organic depression. Ranjeev was traumatised by the incident, believing it to be his fault. He was later diagnosed as suffering from severe psychiatric disorder. He was never able to operate a crane again. After lengthy medical treatment, it transpired that Sanjay was permanently paralysed from the waist down and would never walk again. An investigation into the cause of the crane failure indicated the crane had not been serviced for several weeks because AB Crane's maintenance engineer 
had been off on long-term sick leave. This meant that the crane had been unsafe to operate on the day of the incident. So let's have a look at the individuals involved. So Sanjay, first of all, has suffered physical damage. First of all, we look at the Caparo test. Can he establish a duty of care? We have to look at, is it reasonably foreseeable? Is there sufficient proximity? Is it fair, just and reasonable to impose a duty on AB cranes? Next up, can he establish a breach of duty? Looking at the standard of care, well, he's a professional crane driver, isn't he? So we have to compare him to another professional, such as Bolam, in the Bolam case. We have to look at, has AB cranes met the standard of their profession? Have they adopted a common practice? Well, no, probably not, because we saw at the end that the cranes actually weren't maintained properly. And can Sanjay establish that the damage resulted from this breach? So using the but for test, but for AB cranes not maintaining their cranes properly, the accident wouldn't have occurred. Is there a chain of causation and is it reasonably foreseeable? Well, yes, because if AB cranes had maintained their cranes properly, nobody would have got hurt. So AB cranes are liable towards Sanjay. So let's have a look at Ranjeev. He is a secondary victim because he has suffered psychiatric injury. So can he establish a duty of care? So remember there's those two questions that we have to answer from the Alcock case. Was he at the scene of the accident or did he come across the immediate aftermath? Yes, he was at the scene of the accident. Does he have close ties of love and affection with Sanjay? Mm, no, probably not. Now in Alcock we did say that a bystander may be able to claim but thinking about this incident compared with what happened in Alcock is this any worse? Mm, possibly, possibly not. So Sanjay uh, Ranjeev is unlikely to be able to claim. Moving on to Ricardo, he's a rescuer. So can he establish a duty of care for his psychiatric injury? Was he sufficiently involved? Yes. Did he fear for his own safety during the operation? Possibly, possibly not. Unlikely, I would say, if the danger has passed because the load from the crane has already fallen. Moving along to Rory. He's the professional rescuer. He's the firefighter, isn't he? Um, so, can he establish a duty of care? Was he sufficiently involved? Yes. Did he fear for his own safety? Well, it's like the previous claimant. Possibly, possibly not. If the danger had passed, then no. And moving along to the wife, Sonal. So this is psychiatric injury for a secondary victim. Can she establish a duty of care? Was she at the scene of the accident or the immediate aftermath? No, probably not. But does she have close ties of love and affection with Sanjay? Yes, she does. So the question has got to be, does she come in in the immediate aftermath in McLaughlin and O'Brien? From the facts, it suggests that she possibly doesn't. But if you argue that she gets to the hospital and she sees exactly what happens, then potentially. But the suggestion from the scenario is that she suffers the psychiatric injury due to what she's told rather than what she sees. So, unlikely. And the final thing that you need to do, ladies and gentlemen, and you've lived through 24 and a half minutes of this so far, I'm very, very proud of anybody who is still with me, is to identify, is this area of law satisfactory? And the questions that you need to focus on using your case law are things like, the sudden shock requirement, is this fair? Is the proximity requirement for secondary victims appropriate? Do the closeness of relationship rules work in modern society? Is it fair for the possession of rescuers? And my top tip would be, have a look at the Law Commission Report 1998. There's a newspaper extract um, which will be linked on the comment section of this video for you to have a look at. So thank you very much for anybody who lived through that 25 minutes. Um, if you've got any questions, please put them in the comments box below and well done.